Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mary, for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about the no, uh, social cognitive functions in childhood. And I have, okay, so empathy, the roots of empathy, in fact, in many ways, are social cognitive abilities. And they include the understanding of the mental states of others, the awareness and understanding of emotions. And social cognition plays a very critical role in the brain development, early brain development. It's crucial for fostering social competence, but it is also very important for shaping learning. Children learn much better in a social situation than they would with a video, for example. So social cognition is really important in terms of early childhood education and development. And the mastery of social cognitive skills undergoes a really long developmental path. So children acquire these skills all throughout their childhood and go into adulthood. And the failure to acquire social cognitive skills can have very serious impact on their behavior, their <laughs> academics, and um, social um, futures. The neural basis of um, uh, social cognitive behaviors, we've heard some about in the last uh, day and a half. And we know that they are belong to very strong connections involving the frontal lobes of the brain, frontal to parietal areas of the brain, as well as those deep gray matter areas in the brain, particularly to the frontal lobes. And there is a lot that's known about these in adults, but much less is known about the maturation of these neural circuits and how that maturation impacts children and their acquisition of their skills. And in particular, and this is uh, what I do a lot of my work is, is those who are high risk for these social cognitive difficulties, which includes children with autism or very preterm born children. And I'll touch on those two populations as other people have done in their talks over the um, lecture. So I'm going to talk about three different areas of social cognition for you today. Emotional phase processing, attachment studies, and theory of mind. You can see on that I have MEG, fMRI, MEG, you know, so I'm going to do a little digression into my methodologies. So first, we use MRI. You've heard a lot about MRI today. We all know it's this very important clinical tool. I work in diagnostic imaging as well. It's, it's really important clinically, but it's also very important for research, and I'll show you some examples of functional imaging. I do a lot of structural imaging as well in these populations, but I, I can talk to you about it afterwards if you want. All I'm going to show you is the functional imaging. But the other technology that I use is magnetoencephalography, and you're probably less familiar with this, apart from a few in the room. Um, it is very, very good for understanding brain function. So it looks at the magnetic fields of the brain, and it's like the electrical fields, but they are better measured. They can get very good um, localization, source localization, and very good timing. So we know when and where things are happening in the brain. It is also, you can see the little girl lying in there, it's really not intimidating. It's entirely silent. They go into the MEG scanner much easier than an MRI scanner. We can test children quite easily, and we can do a huge range of cognitive protocols. Um, so we can look at source activity like we do in fMRI, I'll show you some examples, but as well as connectivity measures among that are neurophysiologically relevant. And so I'll do another little digression for connectivity. So those are brain waves. It's the way the brain processes information is through these brain waves and through the communication via brain waves is how the brain works. And they oscillate in different frequency bands. And this we can see with MEG. You can see it with EEG as well, but I'm only talking about MEG. And there are different frequencies, and those frequency bands are related to different types of information processing globally. And so they're really quite interesting. And they're called different um, Greek letters. The gamma is the fastest, going down beta, alpha, theta, and delta. I'm not going to talk about delta. So all of these different frequency bands, you'll hear me mentioning them, but it's just the speed of the frequency that we're measuring in the brain. And when you think about brain circuitry, it's like a transportation system. So there's the airport or airline circuits in North America. And you can see that the information is going between hubs. And the hubs are airports. And some are busier than others. And that's why they have bigger circles. But we all know that a minor disruption can knock the whole system out. Okay. And so what I'm going to be talking to you about 
are circuits in the brain and connectivity among these brain areas. So in typical developing children, they recognize happy faces first. They're the easiest to recognize. They recognize them very, very early in life. Whereas negative emotions, like anger, they recognize later. They're harder emotions to recognize. It takes children longer before they're accurately recognizing angry faces. And angry faces are particularly difficult for children who have social cognitive difficulties to recognize, such as children with autism. They have more difficulty with anger. So what we ran is an emotional faces protocol. We used happy and angry faces because those are the emotions that children see the most often, if you will. And each of these faces was paired with a scrambled version of the same face. Because what we were doing is we weren't asking the children to identify an emotional face. Because for young children and children with social cognitive difficulties, that's too hard for them. So they have to identify the side of the scrambled pattern. So they would be pressing on the right to the right button on the first one and on the left button on the second one because they're asked to identify the side of the scrambled pattern. So the processing of emotions is automatic. We heard about automatic processing yesterday. So this is automatic or implicit emotional processing. The brain can't ignore emotional faces. So we get the information anyways without causing uh, difficulty for the children. So we completed this task in over 100 children, teenagers, and adults from a wide age range. And all this was in MEG. And when we average across this whole age range, there are lots of areas that are connected for the processing of happy faces. And you can see this is, there we have the occipital areas, of course, because it's visual stimuli. Then we have those deep temporal regions, like the fusiform gyrus, is very important for faces. We have the deep gray matter areas, like the amygdala, the parahippocampal area, very important for emo uh, emotional stimuli, and of course the frontal areas of the brain. And those are very important for integration in the social cognitive functions. So all those areas are active to an emotional face. It's a complex network. And we can also look at how they change across age. So we know that we get better at recognizing faces with age. If you ask a very young children, how would you recognize pride? Right. So these abilities improve with age. And so it doesn't really matter the frequency band or whether it's happy or angry. All of these circuits get better with age. We get better and faster at recognizing emotions with age. They involve some different networks, depending on whether they're happy or angry, but they all involve that fusiform gyrus and some frontal and deep gray matter. We can also look at uh, connectivity as a function of emotion, so not just age. So here's an example with angry and happy faces. And you can see that there's significant uh, differences between that happy and angry. They're all, they're located in the, they are anchored rather in the occipital region but you get more on the right side with angry, and the, the happy is more bilateral and greater activation to the happy faces. And so we can look at emotion differences as well. This happened to be in adolescence. It was the same in children and adults. So what do we do when we look at, contrast this to children with autism who have difficulty in processing emotional faces? So just for those of you who don't know autism, it affects about one in uh, 59 children, so it's quite common. So out of every two classrooms, there'd be one child with autism. There's no unifying pathophysiological theory. There's no biological marker or test. It's a clinical diagnosis. It can be very accurately diagnosed, but it's a clinical diagnosis. And there's been a recent focus on um, atypical brain function and connectivity in autism because it's really um, the function of the brain that underlies this disorder. It's not really the structure, it's the function. And so there's a big push for studying function. So we ran exactly the same task in children, um, adolescents and adults with autism. So the same task, they're pressing to the scrambled face so they, it's not difficult for them. They can do the task easily. The um, error rate is close to zero for them as well as for the controls. And what do we get? So you can see here in the children's group, these are seven to 10 year old children, so they're not babies. They're doing the task quite well, but they have the right insula. Is in, this whole little network is greatly increased, significantly increased in the children with autism. They're responding more to the happy faces than the typically developing children. 
So there's a good, we'd call it atypical, but in fact, they're responding more. And so children, when they're very young, respond more to happy faces. And this goes until four to six years of age. It's called a positivity bias. And then when you get old, like me, there's another positivity bias. In the middle, there's a negativity bias. Um, but so these children, we think, still have their positivity bias. The children with autism are not learning the emotions as fast, and so they're still processing the positive faces better than the um, negative faces. And what happens with teenagers? Well, teenagers are teenagers, right? They're different. So these are the 12 to 15-year-olds, and we found decreased connectivity in the children with autism, but only to the angry faces. So you can see in the, um, it's also anchored in the insula, the right insula, again, really important for salience, for attention to important stimuli. And that whole network, and so it's bigger in the children, um, the adolescent children. And you can see those two lines on, on the lower graph. The blue line is the children with autism, and the green line is the control children. So that network is sort of turning on and then going off as they're looking at the angry faces. And it's just not as active in the children who have autism. So they're not processing these angry faces as well. There's no difference between the happy faces. The happy faces have, have caught up. And when we looked at adults, we saw similar things, but it was in the gamma band. So it keeps going up in higher frequency bands with age, which is normal in terms of the brain development. So with um, this, we also looked at very preterm born children. And yesterday, a number of people talked about the very preterms. So these are children who are born more than two months too early. And our group included children who are born, on average, three months too early. So they're really, really early babies. And many of these children, not all of them, but in fact, the majority of these children have some difficulties, particularly when they reach school age. Um, behavioral difficulties, somebody met yesterday mentioned that they're a higher risk for autism, which is true, academic difficulties. And there's currently no way of predicting outcome from when they're a baby, from the, uh, from the NICU. And so we want to understand how their brains develop functions in the hope of being able to better predict and improve their outcomes. So we ran a similar task in a whole group of very preterm born children, and I, with happy and angry faces. And these are children that we have been following since birth. So when they were tiny babies, when they were like tiny, tiny little babies, we put them in the scanner in a special incubator. I mean, everything was very correct. Um, and then we studied them at birth, at term equivalent age, at two years, four years, six years, and eight years. So we have this longitudinal data in these uh, children. And I'm going to show you some data from six and eight years of age. And when we looked at their behaviorally, you can see in blue is the six-year-old data, and in red is the eight-year-old data. And this is just their behavioral rating of these emotional faces. So these are ch other children's emotional faces. We used other children because we thought it would be more accurate for them. And you can see on the left side that between six in blue and eight in red, children get better at, they actually rate the negative faces, the angry faces, more negatively. They're refining their perception of faces. And on the right side, they're um, rating the happy faces as more positive. OK, so positive is up and negative is down. The only difference between the groups was if the angry faces. The very preterm children are not showing the same rate of improving their discrimination with angry faces. They don't see them as, as negative as, the typical children, as their typical peers. So what happens in the brain? Well, the differences, as you can probably guess, was with angry faces particularly. So the angry faces, this is for the full-term children, they show this large network of increased connectivity compared to their um, very preterm peers that increased between six and eight years of age. And you can see that it's both in theta and alpha bands, so two different frequency bands. It's a very robust network. And it was largely on the right hemisphere, which is related to processing negative emotions. They're more often on the right. Um, and you can see also, you saw that in the very first image that I showed you of the angry faces. And when we looked at the happy faces, we saw a difference as well, but only in the six-year-olds. So in the six-year-old um, full terms, they process this more um, strongly than the 
um, preterm children, and it was located in that left temporal pole. Again, it's on the left side because happy faces, but they saw a, there was a difference at six, but not at eight. So by eight years of old age, the very preterms had caught up, if you will, in terms of processing the happy faces, just like the children with autism were no different when they were teenagers or adults. So we find this really quite useful to monitor how the children are processing the emotions. So emotional phase processing recruits increasingly strong networks in the brain with age, and these networks can be emotion and frequency dependent. So we can actually go in and examine different networks as a function of emotion. In children and adolescents with ASD, atypical patterns are seen, and they're anchored in the right insula, which we know is a key node for emotional salience, and is only for the angry faces because they caught up. For the very preterm born children, they showed reduced connectivity to the emotional faces, particularly the angry faces, and showed catch up again with the happy faces. So it's uh, the happy faces that are so important. But both these groups of children are really high risk for social cognitive difficulties. They have poor emotional face processing in, in general, and this could in contribute to the problems that they do experience or they may experience in terms of social situations. And so it's something that can be targeted is to teach them more about emotional faces and understanding them. So I'm going to go on to attachment studies. So we have like three different social cognitive uh, themes here. So attachment studies, I'm going to give a bit of a background because I'm not sure how much people know about attachment. Um, it's a, a really important system. If you think about a baby monkey, they're hanging on to their mothers. They are attached, right? Baby monkeys um, have strong grips and the mother has fur. We have neither. <laughs> so in, in humans, there's this attachment system that has to, it directs a child to seek proximity and it starts very early in life. That's why babies cry if they're left alone. They want somebody near them. They need to be taken care of. Um, and it has uh, a developmental course that is largely stable across the lifespan. So once people have developed a certain attachment style, it tends to stay the same over their lifetime. There have been a number of studies of that. And attachment is very social um, as a building block for social development. But as with other social cognitive skills, it really impacts cognition as well. If you're not good socially, it's less, you're less good cognitively to the point that a child's attachment in toddlerhood, like how attached they are in toddlerhood, predicted their academic success as teenagers. You know, so it's, it is related. So their core regions are in, uh, for the attachment system are in that deep gray matter that we keep hearing about, that really important deep gray matter of the brain, particularly the striatum, the caudate, and the putamen. And so we investigated, and that's a very royal we, this is done by um, Dr. Yoon Jong Choi, who is a wonderful postdoc from South Korea in my lab. So she did um, this work, and I was just privileged to be part of it. Okay. So and she investigated the connectivity between these brain structures during the resting state um, and the rest of the brain in normal 10-year-old boys who are either secure or insecurely attached. So she had 68 boys. And the resting state scanning allows us to examine intrinsic networks. So think about that picture of the airplane network across the continent, right? So what we do with resting state is a child is just in the scanner, not doing anything in particular. And we just look at what the brain does in that just when it's not doing anything in particular, not forcing or asking it to do anything. And you take one seed, like you take a hub. In this case, we took the striatum, the putamen. It said, what is it connected to? It's sort of like taking Sudbury and saying, what's Sudbury connected to? Well, those of you who don't know Sudbury, okay. <laughs> Toronto. <laughs> okay, and so that's how we can look at the, with resting state, you take a, an area and say, okay, what are the direct connections from this part of the brain to what other parts of the brain? And so the children's attachment security was assessed by trained psychologists using the um, SAT, which is a very standardized uh, method. And in that, there were 39 securely attached boys and 29 insecurely. And so securely attached boys are children who can talk about their feelings. They are confident that if needed, their caregiver, which is usually their parents, will show up. And they are generally optimistic about their future and their relationships. 
The insecurely attached boys have had a more sporadic uh, support from their primary caregivers. They tend to be more pessimistic and in fact are more avoid talking about feelings and sometimes they are more angry. Okay? But it's very important that these were entirely uh, the same group of children. They came from the same school. The parents did not differ on education levels, income levels, socioeconomic levels. Okay? And both groups had their mother as a primary caregiver for three years. So these are both considered normal children. It's just a normal variation in the population. And you can get these differences. So, as I said, we put a seed in that putamen and said, okay, what is it connected to? In the secure attachment group, the connectivity from that striatal seed in the, in the reward or attachment network went to the parahippocampal gyrus, which is a related to very important area for memory and coding and retrieval. And it also went to that left temporal pole, which is a very important area for affective information, for socially and emotionally personal information. So these boys, that seed area is related to their personal and emotional memories. Okay. And you can see that the, the little red bar on the line shows the insecure, the, the um, strength of the connectivity, and the greater the strength of the connectivity, the higher their security attachment score and their emotional openness score. And the emotional openness score represents the extent that a child is willing to talk about emotions. And it's really an important aspect of attachment is the child will talk about emotions, including negative emotions like loneliness and sadness. The insecure children did not show that at all. They showed increased um, connectivity from the putamen, from the striatum, to this region in the temporal parietal junction. So very different region. This was, the greater the strength of that, the lower their attachment score, and the worse their attention performance. They had increased attention problems. This area, the connections, other people have studied the connections between the striatum and that TPJ area, and it's been associated with happiness and generous behavior in adults. So what we're inferring from this is that these children are insecure, sort of hyperactivating this. They're, they are struggling to feel safe and rewarded in their social um, relationships. We also took these children, or Dr. Choi took these children, and ran a subset of them through a task-based fMRI study, so pulling the stimuli from the SAT. And these are some of the stimuli. And so the target stimuli, there's always an image of a child being ignored. And so I swapped, I had a different image there, and I swapped in the one with the phone because of all the discussion yesterday about screen time. <laughs> so <laughs> here's a little boy, and so they, they see these images, and so in one condition, there are lots of different images, and they're all randomly presented and all that. But they always are asked a question, how does this child feel? Um, or how, what is a, a detail, like what is in the woman's hand, okay? And they're neutral stimuli that should have no emotional content as well. And you can see um, that you, the height is being measured. And there's always a female um, and a child in the pictures. And after each picture in the scanner, the boys had to press a button as to whether the child in the image feels good, neither good nor bad, or feels badly. Okay, so what happens? In the secure group, to the attachment stimuli, so this is the attachment stimuli greater than the control stimuli, the boys showed increased activation in the, those two areas in the brain, the, the inferior and medial um, frontal areas, and that medial frontal area is really important for understanding the mental states of others, modulating behavior. In the striatum, well, that's the attachment area and reward processing, so that makes perfect sense as well. And also in the ACC, and we heard a lot about the ACC yesterday, is really important in terms of cognitive, social cognitive things, social feedback, and there have been studies that show if somebody's being accepted or rejected by others, that area will light up. And the striatal area was, there's a positive correlation between that activation, so the stronger that striatal activation in the middle, the better their emotional openness scores. So it was all sort of linking together.
In the insecure group, they showed peak activation, greater activation only to the control stimuli. They showed no greater activation to the attachment stimuli or the attachment part of the task. And keep in mind, the control stimuli were asking the children to focus on details in the picture. And what they saw is the increased activation, or what we saw was the increased activation in the precuneus. And the precuneus is a big hub region. It's a really important region in the brain for lots of things, but it includes visual spatial imagery. And so they were asked, like, what is the relationship between things on the, uh, on the floor next to the child? That's, these are the type of questions in the control condition. And so it seems as though the um, children who are insecure were focusing entirely on these extraneous details. That's what they were doing. They weren't thinking about attachment. They didn't want to talk about it. And that is a part of the brain that reflected that. So we could see differences in their brain activity as a function of their type of attachment. So they were directed away, directed themselves away from thinking about attachment. So these data demonstrate, I think, that attachment security um, can be measured with brain connectivity. And we can relate it to behavioral differences in these children. And these are typical children, OK? These are just typical children. The model of attachment is, is a motivational behavioral system that gets children to seek um, proximity when they're distressed or alarmed. And securely and insecurely um, uh, attached children show distinct patterns of brain activity. And it's the secure ones that have the activation of this um, uh, attachment network in particular. And this increased connectivity, even in resting state as well as during task of this striatal network, shows that this is a really a, 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 sort of a big change in the brain developmentally. It is, and it may explain why attachment behavior has such long lasting effects. You think of attachment as just important for babies, and once you're in school, it doesn't matter so much, but in fact, it lasts your lifetime. So the final um, pair of studies I'm going to show are about theory of mind. Again, this is something that has come up a number of times. It's really, really important for empathy. Theory of mind allows us to understand behaviors of others, understand the intentions, beliefs, emotions of others. Okay, And we can't have um, empathy without understanding those things. Okay, So theory of mind is a key um, skill for empathy. It has a dark side. Theory of mind allows people to manipulate and deceive. Because if you understand what somebody believes, then you can sort of sneak around it if you have those intentions. Okay. It's not all good. Um, theory of mind starts emerging in early childhood. There's some discussion about when it actually starts, but it is clearly present by four to five years of age in all kinds of different tasks. But there is a wide range of ability, even in typical development. We all know people who are more or less have better or worse theory of mind. You all know stories of, you know, for a very special birthday, the wife just loves ballet. <laughs> the husband loves baseball. Guess what she gets for her birthday? <laughs> baseball tickets, right? I mean, there are lots of examples of this, OK? So it's not, it's, again, a huge range. And it is considered a key deficit in autism. It's called mind blindness in autism. Okay? And um, a lot of the research on theory of mind started because people were interested in trying to understand autism. So autism, in fact, has been a big driver of some of this work, which is, which is uh, quite interesting. So I'm going to start with the Sally Ann task. And so this task is a, is a classic um, measure for theory of mind. And it was developed by Simon Baron Cohen, who is a big, very famous, excellent researcher of autism in England. So the Sally Ann task goes like this. He did this in 85. This is why the cartoons are so old. So this is Sally, and Sally has a basket, and that's Anne, and Anne has a box. Sally has a ball, and she puts her ball in her basket. Then she goes out for a walk. Anne, in the meantime, takes Sally's ball and puts it in her box, and then she goes out. Sally comes back, and she wants to play with her ball. Where will Sally look for her ball? Everybody knows where Sally will look for her ball? In her basket, because you have theory of mind. If you were a three-year-old, you would say, in the box. Really. <laughs> because you know, we know where the ball is. 
So of course she'd look where the ball is. Why would she look where it's not there, right? Okay. So this is theory of mind, and this is called false belief. And the false belief task is one of the staples of studying theory of mind. And so we optimize a false belief task for the neuroimaging environment, which was, which was non-trivial. So let me show you. Oh, first, a little digression. People, um, there have been quite a few adult studies in particular that have looked at the mentalizing or this theory of mind network, and it includes some key areas that you've already heard some of them already in this talk, the temporal parietal junction. It's also called the angular gyrus or supermarginal gyrus, inferior parietal lobule. It's a whole area there. The posterior um, STS, which is related to understanding intentions of others in particular and emotions, um, uh, interactions with people. Medial prefrontal cortex, very important for understanding mental states. And the precuneus, which can also good for intentions, but bringing things together with that big hub region. But these regions have been largely defined in fMRI studies, thus there's, thus there's no timing information. We don't know when they turn on or turn off, if you will. So we were running these in MEG. <clears throat> and so this was a Jack and Jill false belief task. And so this was adapted for Maureen Dennis, who was a colleague. She used it behaviorally, and we um, borrowed it um, with her permission to use it for MEG. So the question is, where does Jill think the ball is? So it's like the Sally Ann task. It's just different cartoons. So Jill is on the left. Jack's on the right. He has two hats, and he's holding a ball over one of the hats. So he's holding it, and then he drops it. Where does Jill think the ball is? Well, she knows where the ball is. She's standing there watching him drop it. So it's a, that's easy. Here he is again. He changes it to a different hat. But she still knows where it is because she's standing there. So those are true belief, right? Where does Jill think the ball is? Well, you know where Jill thinks the ball is. It's where you think the ball is, too. Um, but there are also the unwitnessed conditions where she's there. He's holding it over the red hat. She leaves. He drops it in the red hat. So her, she would still believe it's in the red hat, right? And then there's the false belief condition, where he's holding it over the blue hat, she leaves, he drops it in the red hat. And that's the false belief. And so that's what we're studying. We did all possible combinations of all these and hundreds and hundreds of trials, as usual, with um, neuroimaging and poor children. And <laughs> oh, they were good, though. <laughs> They actually like scanning. They love getting pictures of their brains. And so we really contrasted these two was the main contrast, but using all the others as control conditions. And so what did we find? We first ran this in, um, oh, I, oh, I have this just to show you. So they'd see that. Then they'd have to say, where does Jill think the ball is? And then there'd be a rest. They'd get feedback, actually. And then where, whoops, and where does Jill think the ball is? And then feedback, et cetera. So it would just go along. And so you can see it's about um, four seconds uh, a trial. So in adults, so here, the 100, 200, et cetera, are milliseconds. So I'm just showing, me, showing you the timing, because I said MEG is so good for timing. And so it starts, we had to run it in adults first to make sure it works before we run it in children. So it starts at 100 milliseconds. So keep in mind, that's a tenth of a second. They're already processing this. And that little purple circle is the TPJ coming on, very important for um, mentalizing theory of mind. And you can hardly see that yellow circle. It's the inferior frontal gyrus, which is really important. It gets stronger there. That is to, that's very related to inhibition. And inhibition is important because you have to inhibit what you know to think of what Jill knows. Right? So inhibition is very, very important in this task. And then the precuneus comes on, et cetera. Okay. So we see a pattern of activation in adults moving across the brain mainly in the right hemisphere. And we look at it, I said MEG can tell us when things stop and start, and here you can see all of these areas are involved in theory of mind. So it's a really complex cognitive process to do this. But with the MEG, we were able to see the timing and duration of the, how those areas turned on and off. And it starts at around a tenth of a second in adults. And we analyze this also in the connectivity. And you can see here, because with the, with the other one, you can see when they turn on and off, but you can't see the importance of them. Here you can see the importance. And you can see there's one big hub, and that's in that TPJ, the angular gyrus area. And all the areas are sort of connecting to that big hub. So that's like Toronto or New York or something. OK. Um, but again, you can see that the, a lot of brain areas are involved in thinking about the theory of mind. So what happens in children? So this is in children 7 to 12 years of age. And you can see very little happening 
a little bit in the first couple hundred milliseconds. And it's really not till about 250, a quarter of a second, that children start actually processing this task. So they're doing it more slowly, which children do think more slowly than us. Um, but they're using some of the same areas. You can see that right frontal area, the right inferior frontal gyrus. We have that temporal pull, that very important temporal pull, inferior frontal gyrus, but they're not using the TPJ yet. So that is coming on later, we assume. So they're not using the full mentalizing network, but they're using some of it. And they're a little bit late. So we also ran this in very preterm born children because they all have difficulties in theory of mind tasks. And you can see on the bottom that there was no difference between the very preterm and the full term behaviorally. Both groups um, had higher accuracy for the true belief and faster reaction times for the true belief because they are the easier task. But there was no difference, no group difference in, those, um, in their behavior. So they're doing the task the same way. And so this is what the full term, reminding you what the full term um, children looked like. And this is the very preterm born children. And they're just not using the same areas at all. They're the same age, they're in school the same way, they're normal IQ, but they are not processing this the same way at all. They're using some um, parietal and occipital regions. You can see the only area that is the same between the two is that inferior, right inferior frontal gyrus for the inhibition. And otherwise, they're using different strategies. They're able to do it, but it may not be an efficient strategy. And if it's not an efficient strategy, then when they get more difficult tasks, like in the real world, they may well fail at them. So typically developed children showed activation in some of the same regions. Um, it was later than adults, and there were more bilateral sources. It's still a maturing network. Like I said, theory of mind matures right through to adulthood. Some people should keep maturing. Um, and then the very preterm born children, they're not using these classic regions, um, but more linked to understanding intention and inhibition. And of course, because this is theory of mind, we ran it in some children with autism as well. Um, again, this about around the same age range. And you can see here, just to go over the cognitive assessments, the WASI is a quick IQ test. The, uh, AAS, the ASD children were normal IQ, but they were lower than the typically developing children in blue. Um, the NEPSI is a psychological assessment uh, for uh, neurodevelopmental um, assessment, like executive functions, things like that. And it was higher. They have a theory of mind task on the NEPSI. And it was higher in the, in the um, typical children in blue than in the children with ASD. But the, the two groups performed similarly on the inhibition task. They did inhibition just fine. And their working memory task. They were doing fine on, this, on, the, NEPSI, on the working memory test battery. Okay. So they had some areas where they weren't as, as strong. In the MEG theory of mind task, there was no difference between the groups, as we saw with the preterms. Um, but the children with ASD were rated as having more difficulties by their parents and more social difficulties, which is part of their diagnosis. This is what we show, found with them. So again, diff, not exactly the same as the very preterm. So this is a double contrast. So we're looking at between the false belief and true belief, between the two groups, what shows up. And you can see in this group is a little bit older. It goes up to 12 years of age. We're getting that TPJ showing up in the typically developing group at the top. But look at how late it is. It's out at 300 milliseconds where we get significant differences. And the ASDs, we see that plot on the bottom. It is largely in that inferior frontal gyrus. It's inhibition. There is also a, uh, um, an area, you can't see it on this, that was related to memory. It was in BA40 related to working memory. And so the children with autism, again, they're doing the task, but they're using, again, different strategies. But they're using inhibition and working memory to do this task. And so the question is, if you want to help them, you know, they're using inhibition and working memory to bolster their false belief skills because they, they aren't very good. Do you help them with all, um, their working memory and ambition, or do you help them try and learn theory of mind, right? So it's a, it's a question, but we can say where, what they're using to try and do this task. So the final task I want to show you is a social attribution task. And this has no faces or anything in it. It's just with movement. And we did this task in both fMRI and MEG. And so there's a 10 second uh, rest period, and then they see a little 15 second video. Um, there's, uh, they have to say whether the video, the shapes are moving 
or uh, randomly or whether they're moving and interacting. I was corrected by the IT guys. These are not videos. I'm sorry. These are animations. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting because this is the, one of the few tasks we could run exactly the same thing in MEG and MRI, which is really unusual to be able to do. Okay, so this is one. So you see the little shapes, and you have to tell me whether they are interacting or they're moving randomly. And then when you come out of the scanner, you have to say what they were doing. Ooh, are they dancing or, right? Okay, so that's one. Here's another. So is that random or interacting? That's pretty random, right? That's pretty random, OK? And here's a third example. I think this is one of my favorite examples. <laughs> Help from my friends, yes. Isn't that lovely? And the kids get it, but the preterms don't. Oh, I know, it's really sad. And these are really cute. There's no people in there, but we, we get it, right? Most people get it. Most people get it. And so we had a whole bunch of these videos, and then they had to rate them. And then when they were out of the scanner, they actually had to describe what was happening. So sometimes they would say, oh, uh, he, he was hitting the other one or something, and you think, no, that wasn't, you know, and so there were miss, there were errors as well, okay? So first in that, we had to, of course, run it in adults first to make sure it worked, and you can see here what happens in adults. This is with the fMRI in adults, and you can see a lot of areas. First in the, the visual area is really strongly activated, but if you remember, the, um, this is the ones that were just random actually moved more than the ones that are social, because when they're social, there's so much focus on what is happening, the visual processing is actually um, increased. But there are also all those areas, you can see the SPL, IPL, uh, SMG, that's all the temporal parietal junction area, okay? Supermarginal gyrus, inferior parietal lobule, all of those areas are heavily involved bilaterally in this task. And then we see the pre-central uh, area, precuneus, inferior temporal, a lot of areas that are classic mentalizing areas. What happens in eight-year-old children? So I put the adult pattern on the side. So it's a little bit different brain. It's a slightly inflated brain, so it's not as clear as with the children. The children aren't quite as clear. But you can see they have almost the same pattern, OK? They have that big um, occipital um, inferior temporal area. They have some of the temporal parietal junction, bilaterally, the precuneus. Um, very similar to the adult pattern. These are very salient stimuli to normal children. They get them and they use the same brain areas. These are more salient stimuli than still stimuli. And so there's really a very similar pattern between the two. Very preterm born children showed similar patterns. So you can see they aren't quite as strong. They don't have the precuneus activation. That was the one in the middle. Um, there's less activation in the very preterms. But these were quite subtle differences considering this is their behavioral difference. So you can see here, in terms of their number of me, their attribution of mean mental states per scenario, there's a huge difference between the very preterms in blue and the full terms in red. They saw the full terms saw many more mental states in these videos, and the preterms in blue made far more errors on these. Okay, so there's a big difference behaviorally. So if there's a big difference behaviorally, where is this showing up? What about MEG? And so when we ran MEG, in fact, we saw huge differences in between the two groups. And you can see it's first, and so that's five to 10 seconds, just as they're getting the story. And it's very inferior, starting occipitally, but going through the deep gray matter into the orbital frontal area. And then in the last five seconds of the video, when they get the story, the re resolution of the story, then we see that mentalizing na um, network coming on. The uh, it, parietal uh, lobule TPJ going forward to that temporal pole and orbital frontal areas. And so this is very, very sensitive, and it'd be wonderful to do it while children are getting interventions, pre and post, and see how they improve and if they bring these areas online. So MEG is much better for the task like this, as we turned out, it's more sensitive than fMRI, although fMRI tells us some neat things too.
So to sum up this talk, empathy, um, I argue, uh, we all know, scaffolds on social cognitive abilities, and these show protracted development. This is an ongoing developmental process, and it involves really complex brain networks. Um, emotional phase processing is a building block for social cognition, and even in children with difficulties in these areas, the happy faces are what is preserved and what seems to be working for them. Early experience, such as we saw with the attachment um, studies, modifies brain function, and it modifies it early, and those modifications can have long-lasting effects. And assessments of brain function underlying complex abilities, such as theory of mind, um, give us a fuller understanding of social cognition, what parts of the brain are involved, at what timing, and they provide a means, we hope, to be able to help children who face challenges in these domains in the future. Um, I want to thank the people who did the work. I'm simply representing my team. They did all the work. The first group is all my team members. Second are wonderful colleagues. The third group are wonderful technical people. I mean, they get the kids in and out of the scanners, and then my funding. Thank you. <laughs>